Okay, guys, you ready to do the last show of the year? Okay. Oh, this sounds awesome. Let's do it. <laughs> and I am Robert M. Price. I'm Dr. Daryl Ray. And- Hi, I'm Karen Lumley Care. Hi, I'm Aaron Roy. Hi, I'm Marissa Alexa McCool. Hi, I'm Jerry DeWitt. Hi, this is David Smalley from Dogma Debate. Hi, this is Dan Barker. Hi, I'm John McComb from The John McComb Show. Hi, I'm Dr. Drance. Hi, I'm Richard Carrier. Hi, I'm Rhonda Tyson. Hi, I'm Seth Andrews. I'm host of The Thinking Atheist. Hey, guys, I'm Kara Santa Maria. Hi, I'm David Fitzgerald. Hi, I'm Brian Keith Dalton. Hi, this is Tom and Cecil from Cognitive Distance, and we took a left of the valley. We did take a left of the valley. And a and, wrong turn in Albuquerque. And then <laughs> like, the left of the valley goes right to a glory hole. It's it like right to a glory hole. <laughs> shouldn't have to scream that we're atheists you know we don't have non-astrologers and all that but with the religious people taking over the world i mean we can either speak up or be pushed into a corner i'm proud to be an atheist a skeptic a non-believer an infidel a heathen i call it how i see it i say it's ignorance and you just call it faith and unsubstantiated claims that's something to be ashamed i'm an atheist one more time, crashing down faster than a New York ball. This is Left of the Valley. My name is Kevin, and I ask you, don't you hate it when someone answers their own question? I do. <laughs> Joining me one last time this year is the team that will tell you where everyone, where, the, where there's a will, there's a relative. <laughs> she thinks that Velcro is mainly a ripoff. Nancy. Oh. Oh my gosh, I drove through the rain, the snow, the blizzard, the horrible weather to hear that. <laughs> what fun, I'm glad I came. <laughs> and he can't explain puns to kleptomaniacs because they take things literally. <laughs> Scott. <laughs> oh, guys, welcome back, and thank you for bringing the weather to be here with me one more time in 2017. Let's hope it gets better from today, right? Yeah. I just, I just braved the uh, lineups at Tim Hortons. I mean, that's... Well, oh, that's... Ooh, that's commendable, too. That is commendable. <laughs> so today we're going to be simply doing a review of the 10 best... The top 10 of uh, 2017 as uh, per our audience, because they essentially voted uh, the most downloaded... Uh, shows and we're going to be playing clips of those but the news isn't stop so let's do a little bit of chit chat first uh, did you guys hear that uh, drunk driving will be decriminalized in alberta in 2018 no what how did that come about yeah well they're, they're trying to essentially mimic what uh what the bc's been doing uh officers will be given uh, essentially uh, discretion to uh, either uh, impound or fine depending on uh, their judgment uh they're following bc's lead um and uh, the, over the limit will get you a suspension for three months instead of a, 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 an automatic uh, court date and everything like that. So, um, And if you, you also have to join the interlock program. So it's going to be interesting to keep an eye on that. So, if, if, so it's decriminalized. There's still a penalty. There's still a penalty. But if you are driving drunk for the second or third time, yeah, how do they track how that? How does now? that... That's Do a good they question. say, well, you've got a suspension, so that's as good as a black mark against your Well, what they're, record, essentially, what they're essentially doing is they're giving the police officers much more um, judging powers instead of letting the courts uh, do that. So they're, they're kind of they're trying to free the courts from having to deal with these cases, and the police officer on scene will use his judgment to essentially decide, okay, you know what, bud, you had like two convictions, something like that, we're taking your car away or, or we're just letting you with a slap on the wrist or something like that. So uh, a bit the same way that our, our uh, officers at the border have leeway oh, and this, okay. this, uh, they can discriminate whichever way they want. I think the police officers will be doing the same thing in Alberta. Well, that's, that's you know, hopefully it, it works. It mm. free, if it frees the courts, you know, for other, because there's I, a I traffic think they're, court. I think they're choosing the wrong way to free the courts, though. Yeah. Um, if, if somebody's drinking and driving... And, and it's been criminal for 30 years plus, then take their license away and don't give it back to them until they prove that they're not drinking, that they're not going to drink and drive again. Yeah. Instead of letting them drive and then get drunk again and then go to court and then letting them drive and then get drunk again and go to court and then letting them drive and get drunk again and go to court. Well, where's the problem? The problem is not that they're, that the, uh, that the criminalization of it is dragging the courts down. The problem is you've got idiots who continue to drink and drive, take their license away, and if they're caught driving, summary, uh, summary execution on the side of the road. I mean, come on. 
This is simple. So many execution on the side of the road. <laughs> Mad would agree with me. Okay. <laughs> the canvas has got an unnecessary dose of lethal value. Yes, the way oh you're drunk God. driving is to have a pile of dead bodies between here and Alberta. Well, you got to admit, you're not going to have any repeat that'll, offenders, that'll, are uh, you? That'll, that'll make you, you know, think twice before <laughs> drinking you know, that, that second no, I, I just, I, there's too many people getting hurt because of the drunk drivers Mm -hmm. and that's where the problem lies and i think by decriminalizing it and lessening the consequences they're not going to help the issue Mm. yeah but we'll have to we'll have to see you know how it works and how it's worded but yeah let's keep them off the road whatever it takes i hope that your optimism is shows to be we'll see. true. I, yeah. I really do. I don't know whether I'm optimistic. I'm just sort of, hmm, how does it Let's, all work? We'll keep an eye on it for sure. Yeah. Uh, did you guys hear in uh, Iran, the uh, hard economic times have been, uh, f- uh, the countries have been fa- facing have uh, spawned some protests. And uh, some protests, some protesters are basically saying to the government, "Forget Palestine, help us instead." You know, to the Iranian government. Good for them. But it seems that something interesting. It seems that the uh, people are thinking that the uh, Iranian government decided to relax the um, the laws for the dress code for women. After thirty nine years, women will no longer have to wear the hijab in Iran. They won't be arrested, nor will a judicial case be filed against them. But this this only applies in the capital. So some people are saying this this is a a distraction from uh, the economic woes that the uh, Iranian government is facing. A distraction from the economic woes. Distraction. I think it's a good distraction. It's well, it's a it's a good thing. I mean, it's a shame it should go to the entire country, not just the capital. But you know, uh, either way. We'll have to keep an eye on that one, too. We'll see how that one plays out. Yeah, see, you know, men may have to take responsibility for their actions someday. Yes, exactly. You know, exactly. who knows? Uh, did you guys, you know the uh, the whole uh, Christian bakery kerfuffle that's been going on for a long time now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. I, I hate it when they bake Christians. They don't taste good. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, especially with no sprinkles on top. It just, you oh, know. those candy sprinkles are awesome. <laughs> Christian sprinkles. Christian it's sprinkles. Christian sprinkles. Well, the original bakery was a place called Sweet Cakes that was yeah. owned uh, by a, a couple, a Melissa Bakeries, a, a uh, Aaron and Melissa Klein were the couple. Well, the court aside, decided to uh, uphold the $135,000 fine that they were fined for not baking a cake for a lesbian couple uh, in Portland. Uh, they've already paid this fine, but they challenged it in court. And the, the, the court decided, no, you guys deserve this. Uh, the judges found out that uh, they found that Aaron and Melissa uh, went also too far by sharing the address of the couple in question ah. and urged Christians to send them hate mail. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay, yeah. 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 That, that, would be, nice that would couple. be definitely upholding the fine. Yeah, yes. yeah. So yeah. They, they got what they deserve at this point, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Just- Un- un- unbelievable the lengths that people go to, you know, just t- to prove to prove what. No, I, th- I believe it's in the Ten Commandments: "Thou shalt not bake cake for gays." Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think it's uh, the Eleventh Commandment. Or well, I, I mean, I, I could see if 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 you own your own business and somebody comes in who you don't want to serve, then don't serve them. That's fine. You do have that right, but that's where it stops. You can't go and say. To other people, wow, look at look at that person. Yeah, yeah, penalize that person. Oh, yeah, make, make fun of them. Uh, hate them. Yeah, yeah. You can't do that. No, well, come on. You, you, you have the right not to serve them, but you can't be discriminatory. You can't be Someone discriminatory, comes in no. drunk and disorderly. You need a good reason or, not to serve them. You know, they've got a shotgun in their, yeah, in exactly. their hand. Yeah, exactly. Just need, because, just because well, you're I don't gay. know. If they've got a shotgun in their hand, I'm thinking I might serve them. <laughs> yeah, you might. You might. That's, you know, whatever you know. they want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I never know what's going to come out of my mouth. <laughs> At any rate, but, but they, yeah, somebody, somebody, yeah. If, if you have a reason, a valid reason for not serving someone, but you got to be careful. And and I hate to say this as much as it 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 hurts a person's convictions. Uh, if it's their own business, they're not part of a chain. They're not part of a a, a government service. They own their own little piece of the pie. It's their choice who they let through that door and don't let through that door. And you have to be really careful because when you start stepping on that, it becomes a police state. 
you got to be really careful about that. Well, a retail business, by definition, has to be open to the public. So they, you know, the the government can step in if there is a pattern of discrimination toward Mm. a certain class of individual, or they discriminate by only allowing a certain class of individual to to you know to buy yeah. their goods but this whole thing so, is going to be so then resolved I, by the supreme court in the u.s <laughs> and, and what you have to be careful again what yeah. you have to be careful of so if i want to open a left-handed store yeah and somebody who's right-handed comes in and i say i'm sorry i can't help you now all of a sudden i'm getting fined well hold on hold on well, no, if no, somebody that's... came into your left-hand store you wouldn't stop them from selling a left-handed Butter knife or something like that. Well, right? I'm, or, I'm 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 playing devil's advocate here. No, no, because... I know. I understand what you're saying here, but I mean, if you're saying you wouldn't kick a right-handed person out of your left-handed store, you would just say, "Well, I've, I've got left-handed stuff. If you want to buy it, fine." But right, I mean, but there's nothing that can help you. Well, but if they but ask you to make a right-handed thing, you say, "I'm sorry, we don't do that here." Well, We're not doing retail, that, please. But that's a but that's a different thing because you do have stores that cater to left-handed people, just the way you do with people who have back problems, and you have the back store, so you can be a niche store that addresses a certain problem or a certain condition, you know, by the kind of goods you sell them, but that's not that, that's not discrimination. No, no. Your store is is narrowed. It's it's if, if um, your store said I'm sorry, we don't serve black product people. Product line. If your store said exactly. I'm sorry, we don't serve black people, then you're you're discriminating. Exactly. You're discriminating. That's, exactly. And those are the kinds of things that you know happened years ago in restaurants yeah, exactly. where black people refused to be served. But this is going to resolve itself in the, with the Supreme Court and the the masterpiece. Well, it's already cake. it's already done now. Yeah. yeah. It's and maybe they, the Christians. They, no, will, a, no, this is a different. It's maybe the Christians the master, will realize yeah, once again case. they're on the losing side of history. Well, they're on the losing side. They're, they're there's no the way they're going to win history. because it's a it's a protected thing. I mean, it, well, I mean, let's see. Cause Gorsuch has a different narrow view of things. So there, there's still a history. It, there, there, it, was a time when, there was a time when the, the church forbade street lamps. When the first street lamps uh, really? started to come out, well, yeah, because it was against it was against God because God made the night to be dark. Oh. You know, this this is the stupidity of Christianity. It's always been it's always super conservative. It's always against progress. It's always against everything that's good. I, I never understood the cake thing. Anyway, if somebody comes in, I don't care if they want an upside down cake that's purple with pink polka dots. And Ooh, I could care funny. less what their sexual preference is. I could care less what color they are. I could care less what culture they are. Yeah. I'm going to make the damn cake for them because they want a cake and they're willing to pay well, me for it. Well, that's because you're a reasonable human being. <laughs> yeah. the, the reason that most of these people cite is that they don't want to promote a lifestyle that's prohibited by the Bible. And since they're Christians, they can't therefore bake a cake for it's, it's baking a lesbian a cake. couple because <laughs> to them... It's promoting that lifestyle, they, which is a bogus argument to begin with. Cake. But like, it's a cake. cake. I know it's a cake. I know cake. it's in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not bake a cake. I know. Oh. But case. it's the reasoning. Be, it's the prejudice behind the baking. Mm-hmm. So we, we by this time next year we shall see. Let's hope. I, yeah, I mean, I'd bake him the cake and do something special. I mean, uh, hey, you're getting married. Uh, That's uh, right. Good for you. You know. That's like, right. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, well, in lighter news, did you guys also hear that Amazon apparently uh, remove, and this is true, circumcision training kits from, circumcision the, U- training from the UK kits. site? <laughs> <laughs> apparently for about 365 pounds, it included a model of a boy's genitals, and uh, you could actually practice circumcision. Hmm. Yeah, I know. Oh, uh, I can't see any issues there. <laughs> circumcision is unregulated in the UK, uh, and that's just the tip of the story. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently in 2009, they had about 185 boys in uh, Birmingham Hospital that had cir- circumcision-related injuries. So, <laughs> Well, isn't circumcision itself an injury? <laughs> <laughs> it could almost be... You could almost say that. <laughs> I mean, it's the whole thing just make. I mean, it's just. <laughs> it's just. Hard. It's like, yeah, let's let's have a. Um, let, let's have a. Um, what do you call those? A beheading. Yeah, we're going to try a beheading party at our. Well, house. I could just see, especially in the UK, they have they have some really strange. Uh, well, it's because it's unregulated, right? Child gangs. Can you imagine yeah. young young women, uh, say teenage girls, running around in gangs, circumcising boys. What? Uh, I could just see it happening. <laughs> they get their little kit, and then they decide to go on a rampage. 
<laughs> oh god. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just, I mean, the, the whole thing about the kits, it's like, <laughs> eventually, did they want to have, like, the fuller brush man? You went door to door selling circumcision, door door. circumcision kits? Uh, <laughs> I got <laughs> circumcised in a hair salon. Yeah. Here's, here's a new use for the gypsy knives. <laughs> I mean, they, they just had that said Somebody just, I saw that in, in oh. FARC, uh, FARC.com, F-A-R-K. Uh, it's a, an amalgamation site for news, and they do... Uh, funny stories they add funny captions to them add funny tags to them and this one was a, a woman ended up going into a hair salon and getting a, a butt enlargement pla- like the plastic surgery all in one stuff and she died <laughs> she died from it and it's it's like okay so this place wasn't licensed to do this surgery and well it's a hair salon i mean of course it's not <laughs> <laughs> Why would you do that, right? Of course, so well, I'm thinking, a, a I'll, butt I'll, enlargement? Now you can do circumcisions in these places. A butt enlargement? I this mean, is a thing? Whole, some kind of butt thing uh, going on. Butt implant? Yeah. This is a thing? Yes, it's a but, thing. Uh, can they just grow a big butt the old-fashioned way and just eat more? I don't know. It just, I mean, the whole thing when you say circumcision training kit, it's just, it's, yeah, like, it's, it's, it's like a bad joke. I could see that for doctors. I, I could see that type of there is, kid, yeah, but even but, even the uh, most medical association will say there is no medical reason for this. That's to right, that's right. But there are people who want their child circumcised, yeah, and, which is always a religious you know. reason. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And last but certainly not least, our new Governor General, Judy Payette, has announced 125 uh, new uh, uh, orders. Uh, I guess uh, nominees for the Order of Canada. Awesome. Mm. And <laughs> hey, they probably got some pretty good names on there, too. Yeah, and reasons. I couldn't help but notice. Did you make the list, Kevin? No, I didn't. Oh, oh. Maybe next year. But right I couldn't help her. but notice that William Shatner was actually among the nominees. He finally oh. got nominated. <laughs> For the the man's almost yeah. dead. <laughs> congratulations, William. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> Death, disease, destruction, horror. <laughs> That's what war is, Councilman. That's what makes it a thing to be avoided. You've made it neat and simple. So neat and simple. (laughs) (laughs) That you've had no reason to stop it. (laughs) All right. And you've had it for 500 years. Actually, I think, you know, after all that he's done all of these years, I think I think he's a worthy recipient. I'm sure he's yeah. happy to receive that. No, sure. <laughs> what, what commercials was he in that were really funny? He was in he a was couple of series line. of commercials. He did the Priceline commercials. Oh, I don't, oh, I don't remember. I, I, there's one line from William Shatner, which I thought was always great. I've always remembered that, where somebody actually called him. Uh, he was signing autographs one time, and somebody called him a has-been. And uh, he said, well, you know, it's better to be a has-been than it never was. <laughs> well done, yeah. sir. Well, well done. done. Nice slam. <laughs> Dude, oh, okay. you've been owned. <laughs> so today we're going to take a uh, retrospective look at the year 2017. And we're going to come up with our top 10 clips that we're going to play of, uh, as voted by the listener, our, as many downloads. Eddie? You guys want to say something about 2017? It's been a weird year, hasn't it? It's been a really strange year. But I always think odd number of years are just odd. <laughs> anyway, for some reason. Yeah. It's, what, what, what good things came out of this? Well, year? I mean... Other than the fact that we're all here and in tech, and we did some great shows. What, what uh, world things came out of this this year? Good things. Uh, Good well, things. If, if I had a bit more time, I would have researched probably some of the scientific uh, uh, things that have happened this year. Isn't it this year that they had the uh, they land on the comet? Was that Philae? Was that in 2016? Remember when they landed on the comet there? Yeah. 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 yeah I think that was 2016. Oh, uh, what could have been? I think the women, the the Me Too and the the women's yes. marches and the the empowerment. Yeah, they were. Of they women, were also named Times Person of the Year. Strongest things that that came out of of this year you you think it peaked or you think it's going to continue oh that's a good question i am um, personally i have a feeling that it has peaked uh because i think uh you know uh, like a pendulum swing you know sometimes it swings a bit too far i mean right now there's already some pushback because there's some people that uh i was listening for example uh, i don't know if you guys know about the uh, the young turks and uh Yank Uger. Yes. He's the host there. And somebody pulled out a comment that he made 20 years ago 
that could have been certainly seen as a sexist or or, or something like that. And they're bash. Some people are bashing with that. It's a comment he made twenty years ago, years ago and he's and changed a lot. Yes, yeah. he has. Years. And he, yeah. he and he's would withdrawn the comment, and you had to actually go and dig to find this. You really had to go dig deep. To well, find I've this. watched his program. He's a pretty forward thinking person. Yeah, yeah, like exactly. He, and he changes with the times. He realizes that things have to change, and he changes. Exactly, you can see it in in his. Over the years, I mean, right? I'm, I'm certain. I'm certain there's uh, going to be more people that are going to come out that are, you know, pigs essentially, and they're going to be outed out, and that's great. But also, we got to be careful that it doesn't turn into some kind of witch hunt, too, right? Well, and, and, I think it'll level off. I think you yeah. know, this is the beginning of the the movement or beginning of you know trying to figure out what's an infraction, what should you ignore, what really is a well, I don't know, like something that up needs people's... to be. I don't like digging up people's history. If they haven't actually hurt someone, or, you know, purposely hurt someone, yeah, and, and purposely is the with intent, right? Um, you're digging up something somebody said 20 years ago. Well, their attitudes change uh, month to month, week to week, year to year. Their attitudes change because they learn. Yeah. It's also, My attitude now is a lot different than it was when I was 20 years old. Yeah, I mean, and it would anybody, be very unfair to to pull up my attitudes from 20 from when I was 20 to now that I'm 48. I'm a different person than I was then. Well, right? yeah, and we all say stupid things that we regret the minute they're out of our mouth. The, Notice the, that she's looking at me when she's saying that. Yes, yes, stupid. <laughs> but as soon as I, she I, said I, stupid, I, she eyed I you out. I looked at I moved. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the point is, is that. If you continue doing the same stupid things over and over, that's now, a pattern and yeah. it's different. But if somebody says, you know, hey, good looking, want to go out for a drink, and that, yeah. that's now, just yeah. a, I've, a I've one off. Well, I've never you know, understood. Nobody should lose their job or be penalized but, for that. Oh, yes, they should. They should be beheaded in the town square. <laughs> And it's also why I've always said, you know, you can't also judge uh, people from history with the morals that we have today, right? You can't, because uh, their their whole lifestyle, their values, uh, the influences They were people of their them. time, too. Yeah, right? they were right. people of their time, right? And, yeah, uh, what we recoil at now, back then, was perfectly acceptable. It was the norm. Yeah, exactly. You, you but can't. I think the main thing is, is that women, hopefully, will now be taken seriously yes and yes, how that remark or that action affected them at the time um, will will be listened to a lot more seriously so and I think yeah. that's and hopefully it, it gave them the generally, courage to come exactly out. it's a it's a good it's a good thing. It's like anything else when people mm -hmm. have been repressed um, because of uh, what other people have done to them or they're, they haven't been able to progress or have equality, mm -hmm. um, that, then that, that needs to be remediated. So it, it will be. Okay. So Excellent. going on on our top 10. Okay. Here we go. Let's go. Number 10. So our number 10 position, as voted by our listeners was our good old friend, Pete Bogosian. Oh. Remember we had Pete? Pete actually yes. came on the show, and he was talking about the feasibility. And he was actually giving us, if you that go back awesome. in the archives and you listen to that course, it, uh, that, that show, it was actually a bit of a course on how he, the philosopher was trying to bring the feasibility and how you should see self-criticize -critic, yourself when you, when you uh, make a claim out there. We really had to think. And at that on that episode, yeah. didn't we? Oh, absolutely! Wow. So that's, let, always, that's always been a problem for me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's listen in to what Pete was saying there, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And I said, you know, who show? Who can I talk to? And he didn't respond to me for whatever reason. And so when I told my colleague, I said, I need to go on a show, philosophy show, talk about feasibility. Who should I talk to? And he said, Didn't you just? get a grant for the public understanding of reason and rationality and critical thinking and I said yeah he said well what do you what do you what do you hope to achieve by talking to philosophers you should be talking to someone who doesn't have a PhD in philosophy and your success should be measured on whether or not you can make those ideas accessible to people and I thought you know what he's he's absolutely right so fortunately I then got your email which I appreciated and then I sent you the two papers I published one and the other one is under review 
And hopefully we can now, with that out of the way, we can now dive right in. And, and again, my goal is to make this crystal clear. It's a very complicated idea. Simple on, it's like chess, simple on the face of it, but super complicated when you dig down. So that's my goal. Okay, so you thought you'd start with the bottom of the barrel, call the people <laughs> that left in the valley first, right? And work your way up? <laughs> well, I, I, thought that I, I thought that I would start with people who were not professional philosophers. And, and the reason that I need to get this quote-unquote out of the way is because after this, it's just all book all the time. All right. And that was Peter Bogosian. <laughs> you know, that, that was such an awesome show. Yeah, you know, one thing I really I, I like and admire about Peter is the fact that he he really is a, a deep deep thinker, and it is complicated. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, the, yes. the ways that he goes, but he takes great delight in simplifying it and then realizing you've got it. If you're not a philosopher, if you're not an instructor, if you're just the bottom of the barrel like we are. <laughs> the bottom of the barrel. If you're the bottom like of the us. barrel and you get it. He, he takes great delight. And that's why yeah. he's such a great instructor. And he's a great guy. And I know yeah. this year has been rough for him. And he's been taking some flack and all that, uh, blah, 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 some of the stunts he's pulled and all that. And yeah. when you follow his feed, you know, he has a tendency to try to poke the bear a bit. Because as a, as a philosopher, that's what you have to do, right? You have to kind of find the limits and stretch them. So, oh, anyway... Pete was always a great guy to have on the he show, is. for sure. He is. That, that made that that made for for great. Anytime we have Peter Bergoshin on, it's a good thing. Yes, absolutely. All right, number nine coming in on our number nine position was our old friend Doctor Del Rey. Hmm. Doctor Ray that we always love to chat to. He's always a fun guy. He's got so many different things he can talk about he always brings something different to the program yeah exactly yeah. and we had him twice on the show this year and uh he's always a fun guy to be around and uh, this clip is about him uh, talk about uh the uh recovering from religion and how he started that which of course is something that we're still working on right here to try to bring a chapter of recovering from religion right here in the fraser valley so let's listen to that Well, this music can only mean one thing. It's our favorite psychologist is on the line, Del Rey. He is the high priest of the <laughs> <laughs> Flying Spaghetti Monster Church. He's a snappy dresser and a snazzy dancer. Daryl, thank you so much for joining us again on Left of the Valley. Well, there you go. Lying to your listeners again. I'm, 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 a lousy, I'm a lousy dresser and a mediocre dancer, so there you go. Yeah, but in, in Kansas, but everybody I, is a mediocre I, dancer. I do, I do other things very well. I'll just say that. So how's that? <laughs> The comments of Daryl, not necessarily those that left of the Valley subsidiaries. <laughs> so I started this group, and it was it started literally with a single meeting in a back room of an IHOP. Oh my gosh! Uh, in 2009, eleven people showed up. I only gave them a week's notice. I announced it on Meetup, said I'm going to do this. Eleven people showed up, uh, which I only I only knew really knew one of those eleven people. And I just asked two questions. I said, how did religion help you? How did religion hurt you? And three hours later, the restaurant manager's taking us out because he's closing the restaurant. Wow. And I realized, I realized at the time this was cathartic. People need somewhere to tell their story and to talk about the challenges. And there was Dr. Del Rey. Yeah, that was a good thing. That, that, that was started. a that was a really yes. good thing. He started. And of course, I had to explain that clip about the flying spaghetti monster is because <laughs> on a previous show, I, uh, I I said that Doctor Ray was one of the high priests, <laughs> and he sent me an email that says, "No, no, 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 I am the high, high priest." priest. <laughs> Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, and it says this kind of rhetoric might not get you uh, meatballs in Flying Spaghetti Monster heaven. So, <laughs> how do you get ordained in the uh, I, Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster? Uh, you just got to come up with a really, really good penny or fusilli or something like ah. that, and <laughs> you okay. judge upon what you make. <laughs> All right, I'm going to have to work on it because I need that colander. <laughs> He really, oh. You know, he's such a guy of good cheer, and he's so responsive. If he can help in any way, shape, or form, he's usually one of the first guys that raise his hand and say, okay, I'll be there. Yes, and yeah, he, he's like guy. you. He's got boundless energy as well, right? Yeah, he's he always does. out there. He's always 
at his age, he's in his 60s, and he's still partying. Like <laughs> He parties more than I do. He's just a kid. What are you talking about <laughs> at know. his age? Let's watch it well, here, yeah. Kevin. Not everybody's 5,000 years old like you, That's my dear right. Nancy, but... Hey, 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 hey. Be careful now. She's timeless. I, I know. That's, she's... That's... She's the wandering Jew. We know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, perfect. All right. Number eight. And coming up on number eight is, again, our friend Dr. Del Rey. He's, he's oh, just, my gosh. The people just loved him this year. You know, he and uh, this is the, uh, the, the first time he actually came on the show uh, this year, and he was talking about hypnotism in church. Right. Because we did that, uh, that show about uh, yes. how the church and the sermons and all that are designed to keep people in their seats and actually scary. kind of indoctrinate and brainwash them in a way to Very actually give scary. more to the church. Yeah. Oh, we had a lively discussion on that, as mm-hmm. I remember. Yes. Absolutely. So let's listen in to what the wisdom of her friend, Dr. Del Rey, once again. We met uh, Del Rey at the Imaginal Religion Forum at the, uh-huh. at the time, and he actually gave her a vibrator. So. <laughs> awesome. Oh, right, yeah. Now, did I autograph it? That's the question. Yes, you did. You did, too. So. That's the great thing about Dr. There's Ray. There's only like three women on the planet that have an autographed uh, vibrator from me, so those things would be worth a lot of money by now. Uh, unless, of course, they've been used. Then I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, she could have framed it and put it on the wall. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. We'll never know. Go on television, for example, or YouTube or something, and just watch one of these evangelical ministers preaching. And then you ask yourself, if you saw somebody standing out on the street talking like that, would you think they were crazy? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. You probably would. <laughs> they repeat themselves four and five times. They talk in cadences like this, and they emphasize things that don't seem to need to be emphasized, and you, they tend to talk about the same rate as you breathe. I mean, I'm doing it as we speak right here, right? Mm, you got me hypnotized. <laughs> <laughs> I actually was talking Scott, a little Scott, put your pants back on. Put your pants back on, Scott. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Number seven. Coming down to number seven spot is, of course, none other than the incredible Seth Andrews. What can you say about Seth? He is the consummate professional. The man's been doing this for a long time now, and uh, he is probably the most popular atheist show out there, The Thinking Atheist, which has, of course, prompted a lot of us to even do our own podcast. He probably had some influence on this show, too. And the man is always incredibly gracious. Let's listen in. Around the age of 37, I finally decided to start asking hard questions and not take just go with it, just have faith, just trust Jesus as a suitable answer. It was a video by Christopher Hitchens that really sort of spurred me along. I just stumbled upon it on YouTube, and before I knew it, I was on this journey. And by the time I hit November, December of 2008, I realized and said out loud I was an atheist. And I was alone. You know, I just didn't know anybody. I didn't have any atheist friends. All my family and friends thought I was out of my mind or I was going through midlife or whatnot. And so to sort of vent a little bit about the decades I'd wasted and to find community, I created one. And it's called The Thinking Atheist. The Thinking Atheist isn't a person. It's an idea that we reject faith and we embrace reason. You know, we... We want to think about the challenges and opportunities before us. The website started in 2009. I did a radio show. I started radio podcasting in 2010. And I don't know how we rank, you know, in terms of podcast overall, but I've, I've been very fortunate and very happy with the success we've had. We've got more than 40, I think, 42 million total downloads. Yeah, you're and, just a little um, bit below you know, More us, than but... 300 shows. <laughs> so that's kind of my story in a nutshell. You know, I, I came late to skepticism. I came late to non-belief. But I'm here, you know, for what it's worth. And I think we're all doing what we can to try to encourage other people and further the conversation out there. Mm-hmm. And uh, just, just like Tyler was saying, what was that title you were saying? Oh, just that... Uh, His 42 you, million downloads? Yeah, you, you rank pretty high up there. I think you're just a couple behind us. <laughs> <laughs> No, just I'm kidding. sure you guys are right on my heels. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
And of course, that was the velvety voice yeah, of Seth he, Andrews. He's a very gracious oh, gentleman, he is, he isn't is. he? And, you know, almost ten years now. November twenty eighteen. This this coming year is going to be ten year yeah. of the Thinking Atheist Radio Podcast. Yeah, wow. very very popular that's, and rightly so. That's yeah. amazing. Rightly so. Absolutely, he put. I think I, I believe he does years. have the the most popular uh, atheist related podcast radio show out there, and uh, well deserved, obviously, absolutely. Yeah. Well, when you have good thoughts and easy to listen to, you got the oh, right he's got that voice, right? Yeah, he's got that superb voice. voice. I know. He really has that radio announcer voice. I mean, I'm so jealous. I wish. <laughs> 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 now, that, that that comment there that Tyler made at the time, uh, for some reason, we had an issue that he, he could only hear me during an interview for some reason. He couldn't hear the other microphones. Uh, oh. So I had to kind of relay that to him. So, <laughs> But we made the interview work nonetheless, so. Yeah, it was a good. It was a good interview. Yeah, yeah. It was a great interview. Hopefully, we can get him again this year and talk to him some more about what's going on in the, in the activist movement. Oh, he knows he's welcome anytime. Oh, of course. Uh, I mean, the guy in such a high demand anyway. I mean, he he's he's a uh, he's an activist, a professional activist now in a way, right? I mean, that's what he does for a living now. He does yeah. his show. He's got plenty of Patreon goals, and people are giving him money, and he does talks all over the United States, all over. He's even been to Australia giving his talks so. now. Yeah, he's a, he's a good representative of atheism, isn't he? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. He's, it's a great story, too, from a guy who was completely in the Christian faith as a Christian broadcaster, and all of a sudden to do that 180 turn, uh, it's like, that's a pretty remarkable story. Mm-hmm. Number six. Okay, coming in at number six is our old friend Arn Raw. Oh. oh, we always love we Arn. Love, we love Arn. Uh, he is... Without a doubt, probably one of the hardest working men out there when it comes to uh, atheism. He always does new speeches every time, which is difficult, very difficult. And this year we invited him on because he put out this uh, video series about debunking the flood. And it was debunking the flood, you know, from an archaeological point of view or a, a climate point of view or a geological point. Yeah, exactly. All these yep. different points of views. He's got like yep. eight, eight of those and it completely destroys everything you can think about Noah and the Flood. Well, he's got a great scientific background and he he's has doing incredible such a good work. recall re- yeah. regardless of what it is that you're talking about. His educational the videos. evolutionary process, his, he can nail it. Yes, his just educational just, videos that he does yeah. for the, uh, I guess it's... it's Phylogeny geared, Project. Yeah, it's geared towards teenagers. Yeah. And uh, it, they, wow. They're are super they something. Yeah, they're something else to watch. They are something else. And, and the project he's doing, the phylogeny project he's doing, that he's trying to. I hope he brings it to completion because it's going to become an incredible tool. I mean, he, right now I'm trying to follow the, the, the videos and he's going through evolution like step by step by yep. step and all the classes and all the. the like, oh, yep. my God. And it God. is actually amazing. It's a what biology he's doing. course in itself. It's like, well, it's. Fudge. He's an educator. Oh, uh, pure he, and simple. He's yeah, an educator. he absolutely is, and he's always a he's always a great guy to have on board, and he's always super friendly, and we love having him. And I can't wait to one day go to go to Texas with my bike and actually have a ride with him. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right you should have a ball, and he he'd oh, love having you. Oh, I'm sure he, he would. would. I'm sure yeah. he would. So uh, let's uh, listen in to Arn Raw explain debunking the flood. Think about it, you know, five or six thousand word speech, you know, and I, I don't I, I very rarely go off the cuff. There's re- very rarely times when I can do that. A lot of times I have to have research stuff. It also has to match up with a PowerPoint and then, you know, everything's got to be worded exactly so because I know that I'm going to have tens of thousands of pedantic SOBs watching my video. And you know, <laughs> I know what the comment section looks like. And if you ever actually do get something wrong, oh, hell, oh, yeah. <laughs> everybody's calling you on it. Arn is yeah, definitely you can't just say why well, misspoke. There's no there's no excuse. Arn is definitely probably the hardest working atheist in the movement by far. <laughs> but <laughs> and, today well, he has the most fun. Try. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely he has the most fun, certainly. Um, today Arn we're talking about the uh, series of videos you did uh, for disproving Noah's flood. Um, the first question I gotta ask I guess is why Noah's flood? Why go with that? Well, isn't it sad that we have to do this anymore? I mean, this is the 21st century, really? we got to have this goddamn conversation? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, shit. And, and I've been thinking about doing this series for years and years and years, and there was a time when I thought, okay, we're, we're finally over it. Enough people understand that the flood just never happened. But no, I live in Texas where every representative of my state government, all of them, believe 
that the flood really happened. No, yeah, that's just no. sad. Ouch. No. Yeah, and so now that now that the federal government is in the same niche, the rest of the country is going to start understanding this too, because everybody in the federal government says that you know the, the Earth is fifty five hundred years old, and you know and that that's the extent of human history and so forth. These are these are the Trump advisors that are saying these sorts of things so and then mike pence you know our our beloved vice president i did a video about him where he was talking about can't we just teach evolution is just a theory <laughs> uh, i know that there's got to be some extra level criminal cause to backhand a vice president but i still have these little visions <laughs> <laughs> yes that was so hard that, all. that was awesome yeah. what an awesome show <laughs> that's most fun about Aaron is that you get the scholar and the biker yes and they collide yes! in this yes! magnificent personality where he's you, you learn something and you just have so much fun listening to him and you never know where he's going to go he, you have no idea he can start out on this very scholarly level and then it can just degrade into a bad he's joke he's relatable and you, yeah it's wonderful he's totally really relatable he, yeah, he's the he guy is. he's the guy that doesn't come out of academia he doesn't come out as a professor or anything like that. He he looks like you know, the biker that walks from next door, yeah. and he speaks with such eloquence, and he explains it, and he's bang. And you cannot help but love Arn. No, I wonder if it's because he comes from Texas. <laughs> I, I, I think that's how it's frustrating. You know, having lived there for so long myself, it's frustrating. But he makes the most of oh, it. Oh, absolutely. You know, he absolutely. really does. And his lovely wife Lalandra too. And she yeah. she was just a. Pearl and they were just an awesome, awesome couple, and they've been on the show. Uh, I think that he he is the guest that we've had on the most four times. Yeah, three, four times for sure yeah. over the years there. And uh, I know full well that I can always, if I f find a good reason to, to to give him a call, that he'll say sure, he'll come back on the show. So we'll probably have him again in the next year. If you're gonna good. do one with him, Kevin, do mm -hmm. something on education itself. Because him and his wife are very big on education. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Absolutely, and we can always count on that. Yeah. We can always count on that. Oh, uh, okay. Hey, we're halfway through already. Whoa, good mm -hmm. for us. No. <laughs> I don't believe you. Number five. All right, coming in at number five is the winner from last year, our old friend David Fitzgerald. Uh, now, last year, he was the highest downloaded show, and we did a look at St. Paul. We Remember that, and it's still a very highly rated show for amongst all the shows that we have. And uh, this year we had him on, and he was talking about his latest book, which was Jesus Mything in Action. <laughs> David is also one of these guys that you know. I remember the first time I interviewed uh, uh, David. Mm -hmm. uh, he basically said, okay, well, let me unfriend un un a few people on Facebook so I can friend you. <laughs> and he did. And then we had the interview, and then we had a computer glitch, and we lost the interview. So then I, I, I went back to him and said, I'm so sorry, Dave. I lost the interview. Computer froze, something like that. I said, I said is there a possibility we could do it again at some point? I said, yeah, let's do it again. Like I think it was like the day or tomorrow or something like that. I said, oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> so we ended up redoing the interview. And that's how, you know, the extra step he took, yeah. you know, for, for, for people. And he's, he's just a superb guy that way. He is. He absolutely is, and he's one of our favorites as well. He and sure is. Absolutely. He's, he's been on the show several times, too. I think him and Aaron are the two guests mm -hmm. we had the most. Mm -hmm. And we'll have him again in 2018 in his latest book that's coming out, and we'll have him in February. Keep on writing. Keep exactly, on writing. exactly. <laughs> yeah. But this is going to be different because it's not a, a, I believe the, the book he's, uh, that, that just came out is not a historicity book. It's actually just a book of fiction. It's just yeah. like fiction, so that's going to be an interesting fiction. Interview. So it falls right a, in. That falls makes right for a good with, conversation too. It falls right in with all the religious books. Uh, absolutely <laughs> does. Fiction, <you> know. <laughs> so let's listen in to David Fitzgerald about his book "Jesus Mything in Action." But even if there was a Jesus, as Robert Price has pointed out, for all extents and purposes, there isn't one anymore because everything that we know about that guy comes from sources that were written to have nothing to do with anybody who actually lived in the first century. Mm, yes, yes, indeed. And that, that is good for atheists to know. I've got, I've got a friend of mine who's, a, who's starting to be a, become a Christian apologist. And uh, so, we, we get into the base, uh, him and I. He's a, he's a really nice Christian, you know, and uh, yeah. I'm not going to name him. But <laughs> he, he always challenges me. Says, he says, it's not fair. He says, you know, 
uh, you're telling me that you don't think Jesus existed, but yet you're not applying the same standard of evidence that you're applying for, example, Alexander the Great. He says, we have very little evidence for Alexander the Great either. What would your response to that be? The, the opposite is true. It's like everything we have on anybody in the ancient world, Alexander is a great example. We have multiple lines of evidence that support the, the idea that there was a, an Alexander the Great as opposed to just a myth of Alexander the Great or a legend of Alexander the Great. Mm. Um, we've got physical evidence. We've got written evidence. We've got uh, the actual physical brute facts that things could not have happened unless he actually had taken his army and gone through all these places and conquered them. Um, you, you couldn't just fake that. Whereas everything we know about Jesus, you could it can all be explained by people believing what someone told them about that. That you know that even if there had been a Jesus, he basically is irrelevant for what became Christianity. Number four. Our number four spot goes to none other than Doctor Jerry Coyne. Great evolutionary biologist. The man is a pearl and totally uh, underrated in the, on the, the the speaking circuit, I would say. And he comes in to talk to us about uh, why evolution is true and why Christians and people that are theists in any way, shape, or form, anyway, will have a tendency to fight against evolution. So let's listen in to Dr. Jerry Coyne. Evolution is so anathema to believers. It's not just fundamentalists who are opposed to evolution in America. Uh, 42 or 43 percent of Americans are young earth creationists when it comes to humans. And that's not, those aren't all fundamentalist, Bible-bashing, snake-handling people. So I was just wondering, you know, what is it about evolution that makes it so... Um, despise it uniquely amongst the sciences to um, the average American. A candidate, I think, is somewhat more enlightened about this, although I don't know the statistics. But so I started reading theology, and that was my downfall. <laughs> oh, no! Greek theology is like, you know, um, the old Uncle Remus thing about getting stuck in the tar baby because you can't you can't get out of it. I mean, I was both horrified and fascinated. Um, horror, fascinated because I apparently intelligent human beings could believe in such insane stuff, <laughs> and um, horrified because they believed in such insane stuff, which you know was palpably untrue in many cases. And so eventually I read more and more and more theology from the most simplistic theology of the creationists through the sort of metal brass stuff like C.S. Lewis, mere Christianity, all the way up to highfalutin, what I call sophisticated theology, people like Alvin Plantinga, John Hart, and others. And at the end of that endeavor, I, just, I wrote a book about it called Faith Versus Fact, which was explicitly anti-religious in the sense that I said that science and religion are incompatible and that religion wasn't a way of knowing anything about the world. So, you know, both of those books have captured some of the public attention. So I guess if I'm known to the public, it's that and maybe some of my popular writings. And that was Dr. Jerry Coyne. Yeah, he doesn't Very appear good. live at any of the uh, events, does oh, he? Or I, I met, does yes, he? I met him in Imaginal he, Religion. Oh. Yeah, uh, he's he's uh, not as out there as a lot of people are. Yeah, uh, he's not as uh, quite as well known, but he should be because the man is absolutely brilliant. He is. Well, he and he and Peter Bogosian are pretty close friends. It'd be a lot of fun to be able to sit in on a... Oh, yeah. I mean, I probably wouldn't be able to understand it after they, <laughs> you know, after they got through, you know, with the greetings part of it. The but, evolutionist and the philosopher yeah. versus us. <laughs> yeah. No, it was uh, it was great that he agreed to come on. That yes. was, uh, well, that yeah, was I sort of, special. I sort of bribed him with a bottle of Crown Royal. <laughs> so that, 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 that kind of helped. That's a good bribe. Yeah, it's a good bribe. You know, I thought when he came to up it here worked. for Imagine No Religion, I was... Bribing me? Oh, because well, you're already here. I, I usually bribe you here with coffee. Well, that's that's a pretty good bribe, too, but it's not as good as Crown Royal. We're easy. Damn. When you came to Imaginal Religion, I tried to make myself a good Canadian ambassador, and I was giving out these bottles of Crown Royal to to, to the guests, and you know, knowing for a while that eventually I'll maybe be calling on them and say, hey, you remember me? I'm the guy that gave you a bottle of Crown Royal? All of a sudden, he, there's that link, right? I say, oh, yeah, I remember you. Yeah, the gleam in his eye. Exactly. <laughs> Did the same thing for uh, many of the guests. All right. Number three. 
Oh, coming on number three. Now, this is one of my favorite because, my God, we had a blast with this one. This was the show we did with Eli, Tom, and Cecil oh, man. of Cognitive Dissonance. Oh, oh. Well, these guys were a riot, and it was just to let them go. I, the glory hole. The, the glory <laughs> hole, exactly. Uh, um these guys, when they, they get on the microphone, they just kind of take over. And uh, the, the show there, the, the clip that we have is actually, I, I just pressed record and we haven't even started recording <laughs> like I usually do. And they just went on a complete tangent and it's like, oh, it's good that you pressed record. Oh, yes. Us. And then we're debating, you know, Canadian whiskey and stuff like that. So it's it's a, it's a mishmash, a whole bunch of things. But it's it's just a wild ride. That is these three guys and uh, lots of fun. Yes, and right now we're actually working on. Hopefully, we can have Eli back in April. I'd love to have a, a Eli for around April first, so we can discuss the science of jokes and the oh, science of humor. Fun. That'd be great. So uh, Christina's not here right now, but she's working on getting that. So we'll talk about that a bit later. But for now, let's listen in to Tom C. Solo Counting Dissonance and our friend Eli Bosnick. It's because you're eating her food, right? That's what it is. <laughs> what do you eat? Flowers or? I mean, because... vegan saltines. <laughs> that sounds absolutely That's, yummy. Uh, and water. Gross. Guys. Sour. I would rather guys. eat prison sex. <laughs> Jordan Peterson makes $47,000 a month on Patreon. Yeah, but I told you, I am totally willing to say women are less than men. I'm totally willing to do this. All we got to do is just get paid for it. I heard this the other day, yesterday. Thomas tagged me in it and I was like, ha ha ha. And then I went to bed and I literally lay there in bed with just that sentence passing in a circle <laughs> around my brain. <laughs> Until four in the morning, and I woke up this morning thinking it, and I have literally not thought about anything except that for wow. 48 hours. Gosh, you oh, are right. so Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, uh, well, thank you guys for coming. I guess I will press record any minute now. <laughs> you know, David Smalley warned me about you guys. <laughs> Gotta get it started somehow, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, if you guys don't mind, I'll, I'll just uh, st- when I press the record, I'll just introduce you guys really quickly. Yeah, sure. I, I want to ask real quick before we start. Sure. We have our air conditioner on. Is it making a weird humming sound? Because if it is, we can shut it off. Barely hearing it. If it is, okay. because I'm barely right. noticing. So, cool. Okay. Perfect. Am I on this or is just you guys? Yeah. Oh, just, you're here. It can be just Tom. It could be just Eli and I. Okay. <laughs> no, I, ins- well, yeah, I insist that Tom be there too. I've got a score to settle with him. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm keeping uh, the dog, I watch? so. Hey. <laughs> All right. Recording in uh, three, two, one. Well, online with us, we got a hell of a treat. We got our old friend Eli Bosick has returned. Hi, Eli. How are you doing? Gavin, thanks so much for having me. And I've heard you brought your best friend, Cecil, from Cognitive Dissonance, as oh. well as Tom, who's a great fan oh. of Canadian whiskey. Oh. I did. Oh. Guys, Nobody welcome, best friend. welcome best to friend. the Fraser Valley, gentlemen. My other best friend. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a little story. My, my wife really loves Cognitive Dissonance. I can't listen to it because I end up making jokes across the universe of the podcast. And people are like, I don't listen to their show. And I'm like, you should. This is, you'll get this great joke. And so I don't listen to it. And the other day I was like, you know what? I earned some cog discs. I'm having a bad day. Jordan Peterson makes 47 <laughs> a month on Patreon. I turn it on and it was their best friends day episode. And I was, <laughs> I, was just, I was surrounded by other dogs. And I was <laughs> Ooh, surrounded by other dogs. Of course, wished each other best friends. How could we do otherwise? Yeah. Well, we're, I mean, outrageous. And we're like 45 uh, seconds I, in and fired we didn't across get each the ball right gifts. We didn't. We didn't. We didn't. My hooker... That I got you is on back order oh. again. Yeah, it's a specialty item. She is not cheap. I'm just saying. Well, no, I mean she's yeah, cheap, but not sure cheap. You know, I, you know what I mean. Well, well for the listeners of the Left of the Valley, this is show has been taken over by cognitive dissonance at this point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the uh, comments of Tom, Cecil, and Eli are not necessarily those of Lethal Valley subsidiaries or sub- sponsors, etc., etc. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us, and welcome to the, uh, to the Fraser Valley. Um, you guys are extremely popular south of the 49th. You're not as well known up, up here in the north. Would you be so kind to give us a Reader's Digest intro of who you are? Yeah, we're not as well known among the moose people or what? <laughs> 
<laughs> when you guys get electricity or whatever in your lawn cabinet. Hey, hey, right? hey. I got a bone to pick with you with Canadian whiskey there, sir. But anyway, I'll let you That's go first. not whiskey. Hold on. No, stop. We're <laughs> yeah. stopping this whole yeah, thing. Yeah. That is not whiskey. I'm sorry. That is blended sadness. <laughs> 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 I, I hear this this bullshit, you know, oh, it's so smooth. It's smooth because it's fucking water. It's water <laughs> Excuse me. Water and holes of fucking beaver expedition. <laughs> do for money up there. No, I, I understand <laughs> that. It's, it's, it, they just squeeze a bunch of beaver pelts. Right? <laughs> and the first pressing <laughs> is the best. <laughs> and as you, as you work your way down, you get Canadian whiskey. Yeah, Canadian whiskey is like the 14th pressing <laughs> of fermented beaver pelt juice. Well, first of all, I will let you know that as Canadians, we have a tendency to drink American alcohol to sober up. So, ha, grew on that. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. It's it's like having the Marx Brothers and the Three Stooges and the Saturday Night Live after party going on all at the same time. I'm laughing the whole time I'm I'm listening to this. It's like, oh, my God. Eyes were watering. The the, the beaver pelts and the, oh. The, the whole thing about Canadian whiskey. You weren't here when we did that interview that night, no, Nancy. It's I a was, shame. I wasn't here. But, uh, but my God, these guys are just absolutely hilarious. And they just take over. They just, it's just chaos. It's just absolute <laughs> chaos. Uh, it, exactly. It's funny, funny chaos. And God knows, I, I sure hope we can bring them back one day. <laughs> <laughs> when they so Bring them back when they sober up and see, <laughs> see actually, how we like actually, them Actually, you know what? I'd like to see them do a blind whiskey tasting test. Oh, that was, and see wow. which whiskeys they like, not which they tastes better. Not which, which whiskeys do you like, and just line up ten whiskeys. And you serve nothing but Crown Royal. <laughs> 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 just different flavors of Crown Royal. No, I just, I just thought because I've got some Jack Daniels at home, <laughs> some, some, uh, I, I don't know, some special Jack Daniels whiskey, and I've got Crown. And the Jack Daniels bottle is three quarters full. The Crown's almost empty. You tell me what the difference is. <laughs> I cannot stomach the Jack. After drinking all the different whiskeys I've drank from around the world, I can't stomach the Jack Daniels anymore. It's like, bleh, it tastes well, like cough medicine. I think I think Tom would have a disagreement with you on this. Oh. <laughs> Poor Eli. We were talking at the beginning of the show there. He's talking about Jordan Peterson, which is a... Um, He's a, he's a bit of a philosopher, I think, uh, out in, in, the, in the Toronto area, and he's been a- anti LGBTQ, and he's he's got a lot of followers on the alt right. And oh wow, this this guy this guy is doing talks all all around the world. They call him a social critic, and uh, and uh, he's like he said he was making forty seven thousand dollars a month mm. from people giving him money on Patreon goals and stuff like that. And he like say, oh wow, I can't believe this, you know. So it's forty-seven gonna... grand a month. Yeah, all right. At the time that we just were recording, to say this, I don't agree. Now. Just to say I don't agree with that lifestyle. Pretty much. Wow. Pretty much. Right. Just goes that the old right is absolutely ready to fund you if you're willing to say these kind of things in public. There was an interview he also did with, uh, on a side note, there with Sam Harris. It's extremely, extremely difficult to actually listen to it. Not be, not because the guy is you know aggravating or something like that. It's just it goes into the 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 nebulous and the, the philosophy and it's like it's too much I, for, for me it was too much I can't even make it through the entire interview mm. but I also saw another interview with him where they asked they asked him if he actually believed in the resurrection of Jesus and after about two minutes of silence he basically said I don't know he said I don't know because I don't know the limits of the human body it's like ah oh, mm. really Really, dude, do you really need to explore all the entire limits of the human body to make, uh, pronounce yourself on whether or not somebody can resurrect from the dead? But this is the kind of guy we're dealing with, right? It's, wow. It's uh, vague answers, and anyway. So we'll see. Well, we'll have to fortify ourselves and get them back. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> oh, it'd, be, it'd be hilarious as hell to get them back. Number two. Um, okay, we're coming down to the stretch here. So uh, it seems that our audience has a, a thing for historicity. Because our number two spot actually goes to historian Richard Carrier, which we had the pleasure of having yeah. here in person uh, in, uh, several years ago. And, we did. And he was he was a great guy, and we had a fun, fun time with him, and he came and gave a lecture. And a debater. Absolutely. With no... He really is a great debater. If you actually... Uh, if you go way back in our archives, and yeah. I mean like episode three or four, somewhere around there, uh, is uh, Richard Carrier versus Michael Horner. 
which he did right here in Abbotsford at the time. So uh, they were debating the history. See, of course, he just completely destroyed Horner in my it's opinion. Almost a full house. It was. It was. And yeah. It was actually packed. The place was packed. So it was. It was pretty it cool. Was. But this time, of course, we. Uh, we decided to interview him on science throughout history and how different ancient peoples were relating to science and the curiosity and all that. He had a very, a very interesting response to that, especially when he came to Christianity. So let's listen in to Dr. Richard Carrier. Do you feel in your research you've discovered maybe that um, the, the, the ancients, uh, let's, for lack of a better term, let's call them the ancients, have a, a natural scientific curiosity as much as we have now, maybe less, maybe more? Yes, in fact, it's very distinctive of uh, Greece and Rome, uh, is this full integration of the value uh, and merits of curiosity. It, it was fundamental, both religious, among the, both the religious and the non-religious, uh, pagans and atheists or uh, agnostics of the period, pantheists you might call them, uh, of that period, were all very much highly esteemed curiosity about nature that drove scientific inquiry. Uh, it's very, very different from what position the Christians took and definitely solidified in the Middle Ages, which is curiosity is dangerous. Uh, it leads to heresy. So they were very, very suspicious of curiosity. It was not a value they, they supported. The, uh, the, uh, the, the Christian attitude of curiosity is not a virtue. Is that an, a uniquely Christian thing or is that more of a most, – most religions have that kind of mentality at the time? Uh, it really does seem to be uniquely Christian. Uh, it may derive from some of the more conservative, radical sects of Judaism from which Christianity arose. Uh, but it wasn't really a typical feature of Judaism, even. So uh, it does look like something that was kind of like a virulent new attitude in Christianity uh, that Christianity introduced to the world. And then, of course, you know, once they took over the world or the Western world, uh, they solidified that as a fundamental to our culture. And then, you know, by the time you get to the Renaissance, you have these these few Christian mavericks who want to rebel against this Christian model of being anti-curiosity. And they had to fight really hard uh, rhetorically and, and in every other way uh, to get curiosity respected again. And and really, you look around today, they, they still haven't fully won. Uh, there are still... The, the number of Christians who are anti-curiosity just shrinks and shrinks. There are still a lot of anti-science Christians today. Uh, but... Uh, but they did ultimately prevail by the time you get to the scientific revolution, and that was actually what led to the scientific revolution, was finally overthrowing this thousand-year-old Christian regime that was anti-curiosity. And they were anti-other things, too. They were anti uh, the idea of evidence as the final authority, that evidence can trump any authority. It can trump the Bible. It can trump the Pope. Uh, no authority can stand above evidence, and therefore you always go to the evidence uh, to argue a case. This respect for empiricism as the final authority on, on facts of nature and, and everything else else. Um, that was also not really integrated in Christianity. The Christians were very much against that. The Bible came first, usually. Um, and they were willing to compromise on that in some respects during the Middle Ages. But you still had factions who were against allowing evidence to trump an authority. And that had to be argued back again. So the pagans already believed that evidence can trump authority. They, they were not a, a scripture-based religion. Um, but it took a while to like recover that once it was lost in the Middle Ages, this respect for empiricism. And, of course, that was Dr. Richard Carrier. You know, of all the people that we've had on our broadcast over the past three and a half, we're going to go on four years. Yeah, exactly. I think, tell me, tell me if you agree with this, I think if we were to give an award for research oh. that he would top everybody. He is really the ultimate researcher. He oh, gets yes. in there and digs until there's nothing left, and then he gets back up and digs again. He oh, absolutely. just really is. Absolutely. He's, he's fanatic. I use this word as a compliment. He just is fanatical about getting his facts straight and with supporting evidence. He's really fabulous at I, doing that. Actually, That's a lot great. of people that read his books of it tend to say exactly that. It's some, some, Sometimes they'll say it's overkill. It's overkill but it is because yeah. it's so detailed, and he lifts up every rock, nook, oh, and cranny, absolutely. and he does absolutely everything. He's got notes for everything. It's like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. wish I had like that. Well, the, when, when you look at the opposing audience, the people who would oppose his ideas, yes. if he doesn't show that level of detail, 
you can be sure that there's going to be people opposing him who are going to lift those rocks he didn't lift and bring that to the forefront and say, look, he missed this. You're absolutely correct right. to, the, to the point that his, his critics, the only thing they really have to go on is that he goes against the, the grain. And yeah. He's essentially yeah. not part of the, uh, the, the majority of, but, uh, of but people. That's the only thing they have against the research. Them. See, he's done the research and covered all the bases. Exactly. So they have no argument. There is no counter argument to make because yeah. he's already covered those You're points. You're absolutely correct. There is no counter argument to Richard Kerr aside, aside saying that he doesn't agree with somebody like Bart Ehrman or something like that. There, there's You cannot fault his research. You cannot you know, say that he, he, he's biased or anything like that. He is absolutely 100% honest and he's done the work. He's done yeah. incredible work. Yeah, he really, he when he is in the, um, you know, in, in, in writing a new book, he just devotes Absolutely. all of his time. So the the only yeah. attack you could possibly have against a man like that is either, you know, oh, well, you know, you're, you're the one lonely voice in the desert compared to another, which is not true, or you could might have to attack personally do like some kind of ad hominem. It's the only thing you can have against a guy like Richard Garrett. Absolutely. Yeah, he is. He's intellectually honest. He is absolutely top notch. Absolutely. He, I mean, so, well, he, I think he he has a he, he expects a great deal from himself. Yeah. You know, he pushes himself to make sure yes. that if he says anything, that it's got the got the backup evidence. And the, the funny thing is, the way when he explains that, it doesn't seem like a, like a, like work to him. He's just so used to doing it that way because he was taught that way. That you know, people say, "Wow, you don't need." It. It's like I don't know if you remember if you look back in the interview. He did a dissertation for for his for his uh, uh, for his uh, PhD, and they basically said, "Okay, you basically have like ten of them in here. You just need to pick <laughs> one." You know, he says he's, he had so much work into that. He said, "Oh, okay." So even when you're a dissertation uni- at a university level, and they tell you, "Okay, you just bring it down a bit here, <laughs> bring you it down, you're, you're going a little too far. You here. get too far. You get too much stuff here. It's like, okay, this is actually, actually in his case, it was you're going you, way too far." Yeah, but when you. <laughs> get a guy who just loves the research on its own merits he just likes to do the exactly, research exactly. He, he's not going to stop no no you can't you can't fault him at all no. oh, excellent, right. excellent role model for someone who wants to get into the research field though <laughs> all right who who you guys can give me a drum roll here we're coming out to our number one number one oh. i don't know if i can or not let's see here The excitement uh, no is building. Uh, <laughs> no good. I haven't got anything to do a drum roll on. Anyway, well, maybe I'll have that in post. And our number one spot is, of course, you know, speaking of, I told you, your audience seems to like the history city thing. Robert M. Price. Oh. Woohoo! Robert Price, of course, a biblical scholar and, uh, you know, a, a fantastic guy to have on the show. And uh, we asked him about the historicity of the Bible characters because there always seems to be you know we talk about the historicity of Jesus but what about all the other Bible characters because there's a lot of people in the Bible and yeah like Moses yeah and all these Abraham. other yeah. and Robert Price just gave us a nice long answer the way only he can do it and uh, let's listen in so uh, this is a very broad question sir I guess it will probably take the remainder of the show but who do you feel in your mind is a, a character, a, a real person in the, the in the characters of the Bible, as compared to the ones that we are probably safe to say they were mythical. I would say that in the Old Testament, you have uh, several of the kings of Israel and Judah who were very likely historical figures. Uh, For instance, there are extra-biblical references to Israel, the northern kingdom, and they call it uh, the House of Omri. I believe that phrase occurs in the Bible as well, uh, named after uh, Omri, a major king, uh, then names another version of the more familiar Omar. And... uh, there, there must have been uh, several. Uh, this is ironic because, in many ways, these are the least interesting characters in the Bible. <laughs> but before them, like it seems to me that Saul, David, and Solomon, for instance, probably were not historical figures. Uh, I have my doubts about uh, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, who were right after Solomon. Uh, there's the reason for doubting Solomon and David is the stories that uh, deal with them 
have an awful lot to do with um, the uh, planning for or the building of the Jerusalem Temple, and uh, archaeological evidence, or the lack of it, casts real doubt as to whether there ever was such a structure, and if that goes, uh, Solomon sort of goes with it, because there's, uh, there's no real evidence for that, any more than there is for the Exodus, uh, which part is one of the reasons uh, that uh, Moses is not to be considered historical, but I'd say uh, nobody before these uh, later kings in the Old Testament and a few non-Israelite ones, like we know there was a Nebuchadnezzar, uh, we know there was a Belshazzar uh, in, in Babylon, we know there was Cyrus the Persian, though the Bible sometimes gets wrong uh, who was a king, who was a regent and all that, but at least they were historical characters. Uh, whether Ezra and Nehemiah, a more recent figure, still existed, that's up in the air. They, they might have existed, but they could just be fictional uh, faces for the, the group sent by Persia to uh, sort of recreate uh, Jewish religion after the exile. Uh, the Maccabees uh, are uh, certainly historical figures. They're mentioned in Josephus's history, and uh, they left enough of a mark that you couldn't really explain the, the subsequent history without them, and they're, they're fighting against the Seleucid Empire and so forth. Uh, then when you get into New Testament times, it's pretty clear that Herod the Great existed, though not so clear that the slaughter of the innocents, the pretty much the only reason he's mentioned in the Gospels, is it was not clear that that is historical. It seems to be a rewrite of Josephus the historian's account of the nativity of Moses. And uh, so, so there was a Herod the Great, but what we read about him, not so sure. Um, similarly, Herod Antipas and Archelaus are mentioned, and the stories there are a bit less colorful, but there's no reason to doubt they existed. Uh, Joseph Caiaphas, the high priest, yeah, they found his tomb. We know he existed. But again, the problem is what the, the Gospels say about these, these people uh, is highly dubious. Uh, the, the notion that they were having a trial or, or even a hearing for Jesus on Passover Eve is really absurd. It's like whoever wrote this was not aware that all devout Jews had to be at home on this highest of holy days and got the high priest uh, in night court. Uh, not likely. And that was our number one spot, Robert M. Price, another, the Bible geek. Yeah, another researcher. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, the interesting thing about him is that you, you can take the Bible and biblical scholars and so forth, and we're all aware of those. But what, what Robert does is it's like he's a councilman in a, in a small town. And all of these people are in the town with him, mm. and he can point out where they live, who they're married yes, to, yes, yes. and he can tell you, oh, well, this guy, you know, shouldn't have been here because, and it's like a gossip columnist. <laughs> Don't you think? I mean, yeah. he, he yeah. refers to them, you know, as people who are contemporaries, and he can almost give you their eye color, you know, but yeah, he's got by the, the time he gets story. to He's got the whole him. story yeah. laid out. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yes, all the different angles out. that 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 the Bible talks from, yeah. and yeah, like you said, he can pick off. Well, this story doesn't really make sense because these right. three stories say this. Yes, exactly. And this person couldn't have been there because, well, I mean, his wife was over here and he was doing this, <laughs> and, and and it's like, wow, never nobody ever put it together like that before. No. Right? He researched it and learned it and. Like like the guy who wrote the book, kind of thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you and if you listen to the show, you realize really quickly that the vast vast majorities of the characters in the Bible are most likely very fictional. You know, you'll have a very few minor things and minor characters that seem to attach the Bible into history at some point, but the vast majority of them probably super fictional. And, and it's an easy thing to, th yeah. to say. It'd be like us saying, oh, you know, the prime minister came in today and sat down with us and had coffee, and you write this down. And, you know, because you just take a, a, a person throughout history and just write down that they were here and did that, but with a bit of more research and what we, the tools we have today, realized that's not at all what happened, if anything like that happened at all. 
Yeah, hopefully yeah. he'll come back and yeah, we'll give I, us I some, keep hearing yeah. I keep hearing the idea that a lot of the stories in the Bible were just that. They were stories that stories. were meant to be that were meant to be orated in front of a group, mm-hmm. uh, much the way that we do um if you've heard the speaking oh, what do they call that? It's poem. It's poetry. It's a form of poetry mm. now. Um and, and back then it would have been the same idea. It was like a stage play of poetry, spoken history, but not history. It's, it's, it's a, it's a story to tell. And, and they're saying that, yeah, they, they grouped these stories together and formed the basis for what we know as the Bible. And well, probably most of it's BS. Yeah. It's I, I, stories. I, I like right? to liken the, it is. I like to liken the Bible as uh, some of the stuff we see today. For example, for example, if if you're a bit of a comic book geek or something like that, you might realize that did you know that Muhammad Ali fought Superman in a comic book? No. Well, you see you see this is this is what this is what I'm saying. This is what the Bible is. You take a real person like Muhammad Ali and you add a fictional character like Superman Right, and I think yeah. the Bible is exactly that. You know, they'll add a real character throughout history, some king somewhere, but that king somewhere spoke to the superhero Moses yeah. or something. And this is, I think, is how you you yeah. so anchor for the, pur- for the purpose of the story yeah. and telling the story yes. to the group. It gives it credibility. It, they, yeah, and 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 let's face it, if you go to a play today or to a uh, one of these spoken poet poetry things. This is what you get. You get the same idea. Mm. We still do it today. It's a form of entertainment. And that's what I heard. A lot of the stories in the Bibles were was this form of entertainment, exactly. like you said. They, 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 they took would a take superhero. something that's real, and then they would add story to it. Yeah, they, they, yeah. they take a superhero, and then they anchor him or her and, uh, into. Well, in the Bible, it's going to be him, obviously. Uh, but they anchor the, the the character into real life cities or positions to give credibility to the story. Sure, and I think and the Bible sense. is mostly that. So anyway, anyway yeah. makes all the sense. I, I'm with you on it. I'm with I'm with you. I'm with Robert M. Price. Yeah. And exactly. yeah, I mean, uh, let's face it. This stuff it, it couldn't have been real. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, hopefully, you know, 2008, uh, 2018, he'll be back with us. And oh, we'll, I hope we'll so. Get another another uh, group of stories to <laughs> to entertain us. <laughs> Absolutely. But by the way, Muhammad Ali did beat Superman in the comic book. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes, he did. Wow. <laughs> well, that's because uh, imagine the, that they they had something that. Took Superman's powers away. So, oh, I was going to say, so, no, so it was just imagine enough. that from from the from the totally wrong point of view, the <laughs> racist. Uh, let's take the racist slant on it. So, you're telling me that a black guy beat a white superhero? Oh yeah, exactly. Wow. <laughs> no, really, that's that's kind of awesome. I didn't even know that comic existed. <laughs> oh yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was our best of 20, uh, 2017. <laughs> Yeah. Left in the valley. Good list. Hope you enjoyed that. Yeah, a lot of good memories come back about the the conversations, you know, and the and the people and and uh, just the way we all interacted during uh, during the broadcast. It was a lot of fun. We learned a lot. Yeah, didn't we? Well, I like listening to these people firsthand. I mean, I've seen them on YouTube, and then all of a sudden, it's, I'm live in the room with and them. And you're talking it's with like, them. Whoa! Right? Yeah. There's something always it's a great mind about blow, that. Right? There's something always great about that. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today, guys. Our last of the year, and I will wish you a happy 2018, health and wealth to all of you. And yeah. if you get the wealth, don't forget to wish it to you. Ha! <laughs> You'll get a cut. I'll get a cut. <laughs> yeah, new new things, new episodes, new guests. It's going to be an exciting Absolutely. year coming up. You can always follow us at leftofthevalley.com. You can follow us on Facebook, or you can follow us on Twitter at LATV Podcast. You can send us an email, left at valley at outlook.com. You can also follow our sister show, So You Think You're a Skeptic, that airs on Facebook every week. And if you be so kind, uh, you can give us a five-star review wherever you listen to us. That really helps others find the show. Coming up, new year, new project. We'll be starting the year fairly quickly with, we'll be talking to our old friend Damien Gillis, the filmmaker. We haven't seen him in a couple of years. We'll be talking about the wild salmon situation. Oh, very cool! The fight of wild salmon versus the uh, farm salmon. That should oh, be interesting. Oh, that's been a controversy for quite a while. It's mm, interesting. It has that, been. Yeah. Okay. It has been. And of course, on the twentieth, we'll be talking to our friend Michael Shermer. 
Mm. I'll be back and I'll be talking about his latest release. So that'd be great. And we're going to finish the month of January with talking to also our old friend Phil Ferguson. That'll be good. From the aptly uh, aptly named show, The Phil Ferguson Show. I'll be talking about the whole Bitcoin thing. Oh, I got to tell you something. I got to tell you something really funny. I went to to Google. I I love Google. I went to Google Phil Ferguson because I wanted to kind of refresh. Mm -hmm. And as I'm looking up Phil Ferguson, there is a whole line of um, photos of this guy with crocheted headgear. And there are about three or four pictures of Phil Ferguson with headgear that he um, uh, knitted or crocheted that he puts up on the internet. And I'm going, wait a minute, that's not our Phil Ferguson. And then I realized that it was a Phil Ferguson from Australia. But when you look up Phil Ferguson, the first thing that comes up is this guy (laughs) who knits and crochets his own really (laughs) wild headgear and then posts the pictures. And it's really funny. So if you if you're looking up Phil Ferguson to get a background for our show, he's not the guy with the crocheted headgear. <laughs> Very good. Patreon Very goal. Good. Let's get a crocheted headgear for the real Phil Ferguson. Our Phil Ferguson. We'll have to <laughs> tell him that him. when he comes on. <laughs> and of course, as well in February, we'll be talking. Like we said earlier on, we'll be talking to David Fitzgerald about his latest book. We're starting good the show. Coming up. We're starting the show. Uh, we're starting the year really good. Good, and the Excellent. girls will be back. And next the girls will year. be back. Yeah, which is they better be. <laughs> They're all milking cows. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for joining me again today. Thanks Happy for New having year. us on. Until next time. Working backwards in the only action of tactic I plan to practice now is to attack them. The parties of God's hands are blood stained. Millions of murders by believers, and they're all in God's name. And let me take a sec, don't mean to sound so hateful, but I swear to God, unintended, I find it disgraceful. That many atheists are told to be quiet, you're not alone. Speak your mind, time to let it be known. I'm proud to be an atheist, a skeptic, a non-believer, and if it Call it faith and unsubstantiated claims That's something to be 